Good morning, and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Joan Palaszczuk, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Foreign Service Institute. Since 2019, since 2019, the Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy Initiative has shared stories of historical and modern day heroes who have displayed policy, moral, or physical courage while advancing the State Department's mission. These stories shed light on the unsung contributions made by past and present members of the Department of State's Foreign and Civil Service, as well as locally employed staff. Today, we are honoring eight heroes among us who helped combat the Ebola epidemic that gripped West, Af West Africa from 2014 to 2015. We are proud to recognize Ambassador Alex Lascaris and then DCM Irvin Masinga, who were posted at the US Embassy in Guinea. We're also recognizing Ambassador Deborah Malik and then Deputy Chief of Mission Sheila Paskman, who were posted at the US Embassy in Liberia. We're also recognizing Ambassador John Hoover and then DCM Kathleen Fitzgibbon, who are posted at the US Embassy in Sierra Leone. And last, but definitely not least, Dr. Gary Penner and Dr. Gregory Martin from the Bureau of Medical Services. These honorees helped mobilize global and local responses, coordinate policy solutions, allocate funds, and ensure the safety of Americans abroad. Together, they collaborated with other heroes and the public to ultimately flatten the epidemiological curve during that terrifying time. Today's program gives us the chance to discuss the importance of local and international collaboration, effective communication, and leadership strategies. Highlighting these stories is especially relevant today as we continue to battle the COVID-19 pandemic at home and abroad. I'm particularly interested in learning about the lessons learned we fight, learned we, while fighting Ebola and thinking about how we might apply them today. I'd like to thank our participants, their family and friends, and of course you, our audience, for joining us today. I'd also like to extend a very warm welcome to our colleagues and friends joining us remotely from our embassies in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. I'd also like to thank the Una Chapman Cox Foundation for its generous support of the Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy Initiative. A special thank you to Ambassador Lino Gutierrez, Executive Director of the Cox Foundation, as well as Cox Trustees, Ambassador Catherine Canavan, Margot Branscombe, and Larry Wood for joining us today. And now I'd like to give a very warm welcome to Ambassador Nancy Powell, who will moder moderate today's interview. Ambassador Powell retired from the Foreign Service in 2014, following a distinguished 37-year career in which she re reached the rank of career ambassador. Almost immediately after her retirement, Ambassador Powell returned to service at the Department of State to coordinate the e Ebola pandemic response from Washington. We will leave time at the end of the program for questions and answers, which you can submit via the YouTube chat box. And now I'd like to th turn the program over to Ambassador Powell to introduce our honorees. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Palaszczuk. I want to say a uh, very well-meant thank you to FSI and for the chance to join in honoring these eight individuals who are being recognized for their extraordinary leadership in the face of an unexpected outbreak of a deadly and very frightening disease. In my opinion, they represent the thousands in DC and Africa who contributed to flattening the curve. On the day I rejoined the State Department, the CDC provided us all with a picture of the curve and a prediction that if it could not be flattened, more than a million people would die by Christmas. The actions of these eight individuals and their teams and those that they represent highlight the importance of, of creative and compassionate leadership with a focus on getting the job done. Our embassies in particular were our early warning system on Ebola. They provided information that alerted us that it was not the usual African outbreak in a rural isolated part that tended to affect a small number of people and tragically often the health practitioners. 
They also highlighted the impact on U.S. interests and why it was important for the United States to be involved in addressing this issue. They were the source of information on the on the ground realities of working in West Africa. What facilities were available, not available? What was the bandwidth, both literal and figuratively, of, of the host government and the facilities that they represented? They were the supervisors of the platform that supported the those who came from the NGO community to, to provide healthcare services, those from the military that served as construction and lab techs, and all of the others from AID and other agencies that came to assist in trying to flatten that curve. I'd also like to recognize them for their important contributions to the lessons learned initiatives that were taken after the Ebola crisis had ended. It was an important piece to learn from them what worked, what didn't work, and how we could prepare for the next pandemic. I wanna just conclude by pointing out that the actions of these eight individuals and the teams that they supported prevented hundreds of thousands of deaths. They also contributed to an increase in global health funding. They encouraged stability in the West African region and they reinforced the need for WHO and UN reform as we dealt with health issues. They spurred the government back in Washington to look at pandemic planning and to leave behind a very systematic approach to the next pandemic. They also provided ample evidence of the importance of US leadership and its ability to make a decisive difference. It's now my honor to introduce the eight people who have been recognized for their contributions to this effort. I'm going to ask them to please uh, put their cameras on so that you all can see them. Um, it's my honor to introduce um, Ambassador Alex Lascaris uh, from Guinea, at that time Guinea, and his DCM, Herb Masinga, Ambassador Deborah Malik, who was in Liberia, and her DCM, Sheila Paskman, and Ambassador John Hoover, who arrived in midstream in um, Sierra Leone, and his DCM and, and Chargé Kathleen uh, Fitzgibbon. It's also my honor to introduce Dr. Gary Penner, who was the head of MMED, and Dr. Gregory Martin. So congratulations to all of you. Well-deserved recognition for your heroic leadership and your uh, important contributions to ensuring that Ebola did not win in West Africa and providing an, a, a very vivid example of how to flatten the curve. I'm gonna begin my questions today with um, then DCM Irv Masinga, who was in Conakry. And Irv, uh, at the time when you were posted in Guinea, you were in the first country to report a case of Ebola in West Africa. And facing that outbreak um, of a terrifying infectious disease, how did you cope with the inevitable feelings of fright, of despair? And, and what did, where did you turn to begin fighting the attack? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, despair, uh, sure, a little bit of fear, but despair, there was no such thing as despair. We didn't despair. Not at all. Um, I think we started off as representatives of the United States and can do positive, optimistic approaches to problems, even problems as deep and as difficult as this one, define us as a people. And that was what carried us through. So, so let me unpack that a little bit and start the story. And I know that the, the rest of us can uh, continue on. Um, the first thing we had to do was get the science right. Um, obviously, this is a terrifying disease. Uh, there's a lot of uh, fear and misunderstanding about it, but we were blessed because some of the greatest scientists, researchers, and practitioners in the world in hemorrhagic fevers came to Guinea, came to the region to help lead the fight against the first wave, uh, represent the United States, and work with WHO. We took advantage of their presence to get smart about the issue ourselves. MED was instrumental in this process as well. And so once we learned that as terrifying a disease as this is, is that, but that by staying away from very, very sick people, staying away from physical contact with very, very sick people, that you were essentially immune to uh, uh, Ebola. 
that transformed our understanding of the nature of what we we're doing instantaneously. And so that enabled us to do a couple things. One, we had to get the messaging internally within the embassy, right? We had to make sure that the team and the family members understood the science as well as uh, the ambassador and I did and CDC did. Um, and we learned that you can never over message. So we did as many town halls and one-on-ones with um, members of family and officers and FSNs as we could. And let me tell you, that approach worked. Our embassy, our community, our extended community became a, a beacon of understanding and truth in a country and in a region that was full of misunderstandings and fear. Um, this enabled us to go on the offensive. So once we were, we recognized that we could take our understanding of what was going on with this uh, pandemic and spread the word. Um, that meant that we could go to the government, we could go to civil society, we could go to NGOs, we could work with the international community and um, highlight and expand that, that messaging. Um, we knew we were gonna succeed. We didn't know how exactly we were going to succeed, but we didn't, we didn't know how long it was gonna take, but we knew that the end result was gonna be positive. We knew, we were aware of the, the dire, very terrifying projections of you know, a million people, I think that was mentioned, you know, being uh, subject and even more. And we knew that we had uh, intense work to do to flatten that curve and to roll back that pandemic. We knew we would succeed, didn't know how to do it. Um, let me go back and give a little bit of an anecdote how it all started. Um, just after uh, then President Conde's um, uh, second, uh, second uh, in, uh, election, um, where there had been some friction, a little bit of scratchiness, um, but the election had gone forth relatively well. Um, the ambassador, Ambassador Alex Oscaris and I were talking, and he'll get a chance to talk about this himself. We looked at each other and said, well, what are we going to do for the rest of your term, Mr. Ambassador? I think that very next day, we got word that there was a hemorrhagic fever out in the eastern part, eastern forest region of Guinea. Now, the Eastern Forest region of Guinea gets a lot of hemorrhagic fevers, mostly loss of fevers. And so that was what we wanted to believe was the case. But there was something about that story that indicated to us that this seemed a little, little bit different. And, and in, it turned out in several weeks, we did find out this was the very first uh, outbreak of, of Ebola recorded in West Africa. And so we got to work. Um, we got to work working with the government. We got to work working on the messaging, both within our own embassy and the international community, NGOs. Um, we learned what we needed to do on, on every aspect, whether it be safe burial or public messaging or whatever it needed to be. Um, and we had to do a lot of course correction along the way, but we knew that we would succeed. So from my standpoint, you know, years later, when I look at that experience what, and what I take away from it is that um, positivity, optimism can be a force multiplier. And that really helps me and it really helped my. We, we seem to have lost her, but we will get him back, I'm sure. Uh, let me turn to Ambassador Lascaris next. Go ahead, Ambassador Powell. Okay. Um, in your lessons learned, you've been particularly uh, adamant and I think very correct in highlighting the importance that uh, we had to create a strategic response that worked with, not against local culture, and reminding those of us that had worked in Central and Eastern Africa on Ebola uh, that we were dealing with a different environment. And can you talk a little bit about how you used your cultural knowledge and the help of anthropologists to develop a st strategic plan that worked in Guinea? Yeah, thanks. And it's great. It's great to be reunited with uh, some some wonderful friends and colleagues uh, uh, who shared this experience. You know, as Irv pointed out, the first step was to get the science right, which thanks to CDC and MMED, uh, I think we did. Uh, but the second step, and, and frankly, the more difficult step that lasted eighteen months, two years, uh, was getting the anthropology right. You know, and as Irv pointed out, the the outbreak began in, in the forest region of Guinea, which is which is distinct from many ways uh, in, in Guinea, uh, but it's also governed by well. What I call microanthropologies, uh, ethno-linguistic groups of a couple hundred thousand people uh, each, uh, each with its own distinct traditions. And what we quickly learned is uh, disease and death are governed by by ritual, uh, by taboo, 
uh, and by culture. And, and you don't mess with those lightly. And, and you certainly, you have, no, you have no way forward if you offend them. And so what we, what, very early on in the outbreak, there was a cluster of 25 villages around the town of Macenta that was denying access to ICRC and MSF. Uh, MSF. And this was the epicenter of, of the initial outbreak. And so fortunately, there's a professor at the University of Michigan, Mike McGovern, who had been a Peace Corps volunteer in the region and wrote his doctoral dissertation uh, on the anthropology of the region. So I called him and he said, listen, if, well, and I told him that young men have felled trees across the entryways into these villages and are brandishing machetes at any vehicle that tries to, to enter the villages. And he said, listen, those young, men, those young men did not up and decide themselves uh, to go do that. They were told by the elders to go protect the village. So you have absolutely no game in talking to young men with machetes at checkpoints. They, they will not listen to you. Uh, you need to find a male elder uh, who is initiated into the secret societies of that unique culture and who can speak the unique language, not the African language, the, the unique ritual language of the adult initiates uh, to persuade them to let you in. Now, these secret societies uh, were violently suppressed in the 1960s and 1970s. So finding someone who had actually been initiated, uh, who was still alive and who was willing to help us uh, took, took some time. Uh, but once we did, uh, the Speaker of the National Assembly, it turns out was one, uh, we started to make headway into, into getting access. Then what we discovered is, you know, the, the way that Ebola was transmitted primarily in this region was uh, home health care and handling of dead bodies. Now in, this, in these microanthropologies, death and disease are tactile experiences. Um, you know, I liken it to, in, in some Christian faiths, this notion of laying on hands. When someone is sick, the demonstration of compassion is to touch them physically. Uh, when someone dies, a demonstration of, of mourning and of respect and of love is to physically touch them. To the extent that even the widows very often on the night of the vigil prior to burial will get into the bed with a deceased spouse. Now, uh, these are deeply ingrained in, in indigenous culture, backed up by the, the Protestant tradition of, of these areas. Um, but from, and I think our, our medical friends will agree that from an epidemiological standpoint, uh, these are catastrophic because the, obviously someone who's acutely symptomatic is highly contagious. And then someone who's recently deceased of this disease, I mean, the viral count goes off the charts. So you have to tread very safely, very, very carefully uh, when dealing with these taboos. But the first step is to understand them. Second step is to find people not outsiders in white land cruisers and space suits, uh, but people from these communities uh, who can speak uh, to the communities, but can also tell us, here's how you have to behave. Here's what, here's what you need to understand. Uh, and, and sadly, a certain degree of mortality also you know, helped convince people uh, to alter some of these sacred rituals of, 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 of disease and of death. So if you fast forward uh, nine or 10 months later, uh, the outbreak then shifted to, to the coastal region uh, of Guinea, the Basque region, which is completely different, mainly Susu uh, culture, uh, almost exclusively Islamic. And we, again, we had the same issue of uh, transmission of home health care for the sick um, in a culture where people very often couldn't afford medicine and were suspicious of medicine and, and had a, a default setting to traditional healers, whether it was uh, indigenous or, or religious based or I should say Islamic based, uh, but also the, the, the very strict tradition of when someone dies, uh, the body is taken to the mosque uh, by the middle-aged women and then washed prior to over prayer and then prior, prior to, um, uh, to burial. Um, and again, we were trying to tell people, don't, wa don't physically wash the, the bodies of your loved ones according to your sacred tradition since time of memorial. That's a hard sell. Uh, fortunately, uh, we had a couple allies and first was a young imam who it turns out was a French trained medical doctor uh, came up to me during a very contentious public meeting in, in Conakry where we were trying to persuade people uh, to seek treatment, to allow themselves to be traced, uh, surveilled if they had had contact. Um, it was getting a little testy and this young imam said, well, I think I can help. And so he stood up and said, look, I'm an imam trained in, in the Holy Quran. I'm also a doctor trained in medicine in France. And the Holy Quran tells us that uh, when someone dies of plague, you have a different tradition uh, of burial. He said, in the times of the prophet, no one knew what a virus was, no one knew what a bacteria was, but they had eyes. And he said, Islam <laughs> is a religion of science, and, and their eyes told them that handling the body of someone who died of plague is dangerous, and we need different rules. Uh, and, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So that sort of became our, our talking point. And then what we really have, the, we, we were really stuck on this question of safe burials, the proper handling uh, of the dead. 
And you know, our Peace Corps director uh, showed up uh, for, his, for his tour. A week later, his entire volunteer staff was, was evacuated. And, and he felt sorry for himself for about a day. And then I, after a day of, of self-pity, he said, wait a minute, I've got a training center. I've got a staff of linguists, a staff of cultural advisors. Uh, how, do I, how do I put this to the use uh, of the US government and, and uh, the Ebola response? And he said, okay, we're going to train uh, 250 imams from the affected area on safe handling of bodies and why this is important. And uh, Tom Kenyon of CDC and I went to see the Grand Imam of Conakry, got his blessing. The, so the leading Islamic cleric of Guinea actually came with us to the region and we went to two or three mosques on a Friday on the day of prayers. And he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. And so next thing you know, we've got 250 or 300 imams at our Peace Corps training center uh, in Dubreka. And it was a skill transfer, which was important. But more importantly though, was um, the clerical uh, blessing uh, for what we were doing. This, uh, to say that we're this is not anti Islamic, on, this is not against our culture, uh, this is critically necessary. And then, frankly, it was just a process of, of, of learning. So, we, we committed all sorts of violations uh, against culture. We sent uh, young people with Clorox into the homes of adult women and said, Your house is dirty, we need to disinfect it. And of course, middle aged Guinean women said, well, Who the hell are you to come into my house and tell me it's dirty and you're going to spray bleach at my house? Um, you know, on a much more somber note, uh, you know, we were putting people, human remains in black plastic bags. Now, what else goes in black plastic bags? Garbage. And so people are like, wait a minute, you're putting my loved one in a garbage bag. Okay, so all the black bags, get rid of them, order white ones. Um, and so this was trial and error. I mean, and, and what had to be overcome, however, was fear. And so in this area of, it's quite close to Conakry, spent a lot of time out in the area. Um, the dominant image of the Ebola response was white land cruisers with people in spacesuits driving at a high speed in a convoy into remote villages. And we said, okay, and as, as Irv pointed out, you know, Ebola was not contagious if you were not acutely symptomatic or recently deceased or handling that. So it wasn't as dangerous as, as people thought. So we said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to stop outside the village, five, 600 yards. We're going to walk in on foot. You know, I was, have to be secure. So I sent in a police officer to say, hey, the American ambassador would like to come to your village on foot. Um, and the act of, of coming in on foot demonstrates, I'm not afraid, I come in peace, perhaps a slight touch of humility. Um, and then you go into the mango tree and then you listen. Now, you know, as diplomats- we're Alex, I'm, a, I'm afraid we're gonna have to move on, but your okay. story uh, But the key, the, key, the key skill, by the way, is listening. Absolutely. And acting on what you hear when you listen. We're going to turn next to Kathleen Fitzgibbon. Uh, Kathleen, if you can join us. Kathleen was the charge and then the DCM uh, after Ambassador Hoover arrived in Freetown. And uh, I think, uh, Kathleen, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. I'm not seeing you, but that's okay. Um, I'm particularly interested in what strategies the embassy in Freetown used uh, to spread timely and, and accurate information in the face of lots of rumors and uh, what is not always a timely uh, exchange of information in West Africa. So it's a good question. And some of what I'm gonna say builds on uh, what Irv and Alex talked about. Um, the thing we had to overcome most was fear, and that required us to uh, learn more about the disease so that we could help uh, find people that could translate it into society's uh, uh, understanding of how to how to have concrete measures so that individuals could protect themselves. So the messaging did evolve over time, um, but we had to start out with um, the problem that the media gave us initially. You know, the, when you said the word Ebola, all, everything, the next words were 85% case fatality rate, which meant for West Africans, I have no chance of surviving this. So if you think you have no chance of surviving, why would you get treatment or why would you um, give your family members to somebody? Because that would be the last time you ever see them. So, of course, we didn't know at the time that we would get the case fatality rate down to 65%. What we went out there with was early treatment helps you survive. We did this in many ways. Within our own mission, we started with our LE staff. They shamelessly took, uh, we shamelessly took um, a fact sheet from Liberia, and then we had them translate that into local languages, and then 
spread out as messengers with um, information to their churches and their families in the neighborhood so that they could at least protect the people uh, closest to them. Uh, we did things. We started a Facebook narrative that uh, Pastor Hoop and I did called Ebola Stops with Me, which every day showed uh, actions what that you could take to protect yourself and also told the story of what was happening in response. So the U.S. Embassy became the authoritative um, uh, narrative on what was happening. So it was an independent source of information that, that people could believe. So that was very helpful. Um, we did get well card for the patients inside because they had contact with their families. Um, and our local staff was supposed to get well cards. And so it was a way of empowering our staff so they felt that they were involved. We provided a meal to the people in the ET, the health care workers the ET booth. We shared a President Obama's message about how to wash your hands. And in West Africa, it resonated. People thought the American president cared very much about their health and safety. Uh, we had a big idea of the week, some of you already heard get uh, treatment, hand washing and social distancing, be safe while you wait if you call the emergency number, don't touch dead bodies. Um, and then we had to overcome, the next thing we had to overcome was the fear of cremation because in Syria they were cremating people and in Sierra Leone that was not going to be acceptable and people would not give up their loved ones. So um, we actually created a safe and dignified burial policy where the burial teams that went in had a woman, a cat, a, a Christian, a Muslim, they dressed the body, they took care of the body. So that was one way in which we could uh, convince uh, people that, that we would take care of their people. And as Alex said, the white body bags was very important. People did not want to be buried in a black body bag. We used the messenger in chief, which was President Kuruma, who went on a 21, on every 21 days, he went to every district in the country and to, to hold local leaders accountable if there were cases. So he was wonderful. We had another secret one called Austin Demby, who's now the health minister in Sierra Leone, but he's a U.S. government employee from CDC whose family is from Eastern Kenema, and he was somebody that uh, Ambassador Hoover and I really admired because he was able to give a culturally appropriate measures to replace traditional uh, things that people were doing. And finally, the, the weekly calls that we did with Washington, uh, we were giving information back, but more than really bonded the three embassies together, and we could actually had people that were experiencing exactly what we were experiencing. So that helped us uh, learn from each other what kind of communications we should be doing. Thank you. Very uh, another much. thing, uh, just like, okay, thanks. Sorry, I, we need to keep moving. I think, uh, Dr. Martin, if you could come up on screen, please. For those of you who don't know, Dr. Martin. Uh, was one of those who uh, went to West Africa numerous times after Ebola was diagnosed in the region. And uh, as a result of his and the activities of the many, many others, we had what I think is a remarkable success in that none of our mission personnel had a case of Ebola. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the policies that were developed and how you developed them, Dr. Martin. Well, I think, um, th thanks for the opportunity to talk about this. And I think the policies that we developed, it was interesting because in the early days, we didn't really have much in the way of CDC presence there. So we had to kind of come up with some stuff right away. When when Peter Linlin, the, um, the medical practitioner we had in Conakry, called me and said, hey, we might have a case of Ebola here. And I mean, just as Irvin Masinga was saying, well, it's probably not Ebola, it's probably something else and the next day it was confirmed, immediately he said, look, the French and the Brits have already closed their embassies and um, what, should we be doing that too? And this is where we kind of had to get ahead of the WHO and the CDC who really were not ready to do this and make some recommendations. And, and this is where we were fortunate that we had a group of ambassadors that listen to science. And, and unlike some of the things we hear today about this, disdain for science, our people listened to science, that this was not really transmissible in an office type setting. And that, you know, by closing our consular services and our embassy to the public, we sent a statement that, hey, this is transmissible in ways that we knew it really wasn't. So I think that that was our first policy was to really try to focus on what the transmission of this was and how limited the, uh, the risk was to our population. And not only did we not have any deaths, we didn't even have any close contacts among any of our chief of mission personnel. We had a few LE staff 
uh, who were, had family members. Those were the only contacts we had. We had no direct hires in our mission communities that, that even became close contacts. So I think that this, uh, um, you know, being able to just rapidly move and make some recommendations and letting CDC know what we were going to do, but going ahead and making these recommendations and having discussions with our people about where they were coming right from the get-go helped. And as the ambassadors have said, having the frequent town halls um, really helped, I think, for people to understand what the policies were and that we were really looking to try to maintain safety in the community, that um, we, we did not have to do some of the draconian things that were being done about, you know, you, you have to dip your feet in bleach, you have to do this or that to walk into the embassy. The way we really tried to let the science prevail because the American embassy, the American missions were really setting the standards for the rest. Thank you. Ambassador Malik, can you come up on screen, please? Your embassy is the one that had perhaps the biggest influx of personnel from the interagency. Um, I'm sure I didn't have an accurate tally, but it somehow exceeded a 3,000. Uh, you had mil US military personnel, USAID, CDC, the occasional VIP uh, who wanted to see what was happening and to report back to their bosses. Um, how, did, how did you develop the interagency coordination and cooperation that was needed to make all of these pieces work? I would also highlight that you had an enormous number of NGO personnel. Um, from the American um, medical and international medical teams that came to help. So they were an, an additional piece in a, to the US government presence. Um, thank you and thanks for this opportunity. I think the, you know, the issue of collaboration and coordination is always important to have everyone, whether it's US government interagency at the embassy on a day-to-day -day basis or in the context of a disaster response to have everybody pulling in the same direction. Um, and certainly that was the philosophy at Embassy um, Monrovia at the time. We worked as, a, as a, a good interagency team to begin with. So when we had this influx of people coming in, and I, I don't think I ever got a full count of <laughs> actual bodies. Um, uh, if you talk about everyone who came in, it was well over probably 3,500 people going in and out over any period of uh, time. So who doesn't like having an influx of, of staff like that? Um, but I think that what's important is setting at the outset the expectation that everyone will work as part of a team. And, you know, to be fair, all the agency representatives, whether it was DART, USAID, DOD, when they came to ground CDC, People were inclined, you know, had no issue with that and, and definitely wanted, had a shared vision of what, what the goal in state was, what the mission was. And that certainly makes things much, much easier. But embassies are well placed as sort of platforms to uh, manage these kinds of responses because we have the local knowledge, we have those relationships, we can create uh, entree and opportunity for the people who come in who, who who come in as on an extra level to respond to the disaster. So, you know, what we do, the currency of that, uh, of that, uh, of that diplomacy is relationship building and maintaining those relationships. And one of the ways you do that is through communication and messaging. And certainly in the context of the Ebola response, it was ever more important as you've heard from some of the earlier folks um, that we got the messaging right. And that messaging will change um, but it's also equally important to identify the messenger. So um, making sure that all the members of this very team were pulling in the same direction and were identifying where there were concerns related to information, uh, related to messaging, to problem sets that were arising was absolutely critical. So I have to say that we had in, you know, probably the best collaboration across the interagency network that I've seen in, in almost any place, certainly in the course of my career. Um, I, you know, partly because we had, we, we could see the, the epidemic unrolling in front of us and we knew we had to catch up. And the only way to do that was, was working together. So you have this sort of internal coordination and collaboration that, that went on on a daily basis through daily meetings and again, communication, communication, communication. But we also had this external um, collaboration and coordination that was going on. 
um, with all of the many actors that were in Liberia trying to help. And that was certainly, you know, international organizations. It was other governments. And we had sort of an alphabet soup of governments that wanted to, you know, send assistance and be engaged. And then obviously, at, after a lot of the NGOs all left town, they started coming back after we sent in our DART team, we made it clear that there were going to be opportunities for if healthcare workers became infected, that they would be able to receive treatment and potential and ultimately evacuation um, for treatment at home. Um, but trying to coordinate all those pieces as well to make sure that we somehow at the US embassy side, were not doing something that was undercutting other activities. But the critical piece that's sort of the critical context for all of this was keeping the government of Liberia at the forefront, making sure that they were actually in the lead and, and seeing how we could help them accomplish the goals that they needed. And a lot of that was related to the fact that we had an excellent relationship with the government of Liberia, our you know, a unique historical relationship that gave us access um, that you wouldn't necessarily find in every situation, but we were able to leverage that to ensure that our technical people, our scientists, our, our experts on logistics or whatever was needed could get in front of the right decision makers and make sure that they were being heard and that we could influence what was happening. So I think it was a, it was a, a, unique, a unique situation, um, but we were all working in the right direction together. And so I just, in closing, I just want to say that it really is about leadership. It's about continuing and clear communications and information sharing. And then the rest of those pieces will take care of themselves. But the leadership is important. Uh, Doctor, I'm sorry, Sheila, you're next up. If you could put yourself on the screen, please. I think one of the keys in, in flattening the curve was the development of very effective public messaging. And if you could talk a little bit about how you did that in Liberia, because it became sort of the model for uh, many other uh, situations, both in West Africa and, and subsequently uh, in public health. You know, we were very, very fortunate in uh, Liberia because even before the old Ebola epidemic, we had a very large USAID program. And so we already had extensive contacts through multiple communities, the medical community, the business community, the judicial branches, the social programs and so on. So we had a built-in connection already that we could utilize to help spread the messages that we needed to get across. And we were able to utilize those and, and go out and visit and talk to people. Um, it also, we had Liberian partners who were familiar with the United States, as Ambassador Malik said, sometimes more so than <laughs> the Americans were, because they really had a very deep knowledge of the United States. And so they were predisposed, for the most part, to really want to talk to us. I say for the most part, because, because of the deep knowledge, one of the problems was that you also had people who were aware of US history. And so they were a little, the, I was at several universities and programs where they were a little skeptical about Liberians being used as being experimented on because they were aware of the 1950s syphilis experiments in the United States. And they were, well, how can we be sure that you're really telling us the truth? So that was a, a, a fairly, you know, I wouldn't say broad spread, but you'd be surprised at the amount of places where it turned up because there was that history in the United States. But that said, it was kind of amazing how many everyday people and I I'm especially- afraid. There we go. <laughs> we <laughs> lost you for a minute. Oh, sorry. Um, it was really amazing how um, the everyday people and especially I wanna thank our local staff really took it on themselves and said, I can't wait for government. I can't wait for some big organization to come in and fix this. I have to take personal responsibility. And we spent a lot of time working with people like this to give them the tools so they can take personal responsibility, to give them cartoons and handouts for illiterate people so they can follow the steps they needed to take. We actually 
made up a whole bunch of CD of CDs with uh, President Obama's uh, speech that he was going to give relief to the Ebola countries, which, believe me, that turned a huge corner for us. And we were able to utilize people who had worked in our programs before to take these in a, in a laptop computer out to far reaching communities outside of Monrovia and really get the word out there. Okay, you know, watch videos. Here's what you need to do. Here's how you're gonna be able to help. And again, I, I wanna to touch on some of the things that everybody said, but we had amazing public diplomacy department who used a lot of small funds to really help people, you know, $250 here, $500 there to help, like we helped one woman who had developed a hand washing station because a lot of places did not have um, running water in their houses. So we set, helped them set up hand washing stations in a lot of little villages and so on. Um, things like that, you know, it was kind of amazing how little investments really paid off huge, 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 you know, a couple hundred dollars here and there. Uh, I guess one thing I do want to touch on is that we did have, uh, uh, it was alluded to before, but we had a real problem with body collection. And this was the, a huge problem. It was a huge problem. And the DART team was really amazing trying to work with the Liberian government on how do we find cemeteries? Because frankly, nobody wanted to bury people anywhere because they were afraid, rightfully. And, um, I'm afraid we're going to have to, to move on, Sheila. Okay. Uh, but thank you. Um, I think these are examples of, of both big and small efforts that paid off um, and in big ways in, in Liberia. If I could ask Dr. Penner to come up, please. Dr. Penner, as MMED, uh, you were working both with the international aspects of it, particularly the evacuation of personnel who might have uh, NGO personnel that might have uh, uh, been infected with Ebola, but also with all of the steps of keeping our own personnel successful. And can you talk a little bit about the steps that were taken um, by MMED during that time? Yeah, I think the, I think a, a real critical role that we were able to play was in the uh, medical evacuation with uh, people with uh, uh, highly contagious disease, which has always been a problem, and for and um, for early in the early in this uh, outbreak, uh, most of the people that wanted to go there, the the NGOs, the international organizations that wanted to send their clinical personnel and develop hospitals and treatment units, were very hesitant or not even willing to go unless they could assure their personnel that if they did get Ebola, that they could be safely medi medically evacuated back to their home countries or to a center of excellence. It was kind of a deal breaker for a lot of these organizations. Uh, and there was no capability for that when it all started. Uh, through, the, through the work of uh, Dr. Will Walters in our operational medicine division, uh, we were actually able to stand up a specialized air evacuation uh, system uh, that would could safely evacuate Ebola patients uh, to centers of excellence, which then enabled uh, all these international organizations, other countries, uh, uh, pretty much everybody used this system uh, to back up their their operations and medevac their their personnel if they needed. So I think that was a, a critical role that we played. And, I and think I'm not sure that former Navy officer. Penner and former Ambassador Powell ever thought they'd be running an Air Force, but we were. And we under, we now have a much better idea of what's involved. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah. We, we called it Ebola Air for a while. Um, so I think that was really one of our critical contributions. And um, the second, I think a lot of people have alluded to already, was to keep the embassies running. They were the platforms. <clears throat> and um, that I think our role in that in the medical office was... To, to get the science and to disseminate and, um, and uh, inform everybody what the science was showing, Dr. Greg Martin was, was just stellar. Um, so <clears throat> that I think was uh, the other critical role. And then that enabled everybody involved, everybody that's talking today to do essentially risk communication, to tell people what the risks are, what they're not, 
and the <clears throat> and the <clears throat> information they could trust, and the and the, I think it was very reassuring. So that was our other major role. Okay, thank you very much. If we can turn to Ambassador Hoover now, um, Ambassador Hoover, you and I both recall that you were in the confirmation process when the Ebola outbreak uh, occurred, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, going out midstream in the Ebola effort as a new ambassador, a new team, um, providing new leadership, just the extra challenges that that provided. Yes, thanks very much. Um, thanks very, very much. It's great to be with this group. It's an honor, pleasure to be with old, old friends and colleagues. And uh, thank you to Ambassador Polishek and her team for organizing this. Uh, yeah, Nancy, as you, as you have said, because my confirmation by the Senate was delayed by a year, I arrived late. I arrived in October 2014 in Freetown. And at that very moment, as my feet were hitting the ground, uh, the virus was spreading like absolute wildfire across the country. Um, it had spread east um, into Freetown, the capital, and was, was rampant in the city. Um, the curve, the epidemiological curve, was really not a curve. It was like a vertical line reflecting kind of exponential uh, growth in new cases. I think we were getting 600 new cases a week um, at some point during what, what turned out to be the peak, but we didn't know it was the peak then. Um, at, that, at that moment when I arrived, the response by the government and by international par partners, including ourselves, had really not gelled yet. It was somewhat chaotic. So just in sum, it was a, uh, it was a frightening, terrifying situation. In the back of my mind, I was wondering how long am I gonna be able to keep this embassy open? So in, in that situation, how did I build resilience and confidence on my team? Um, well, as, as Irv alluded to earlier, with there, I, I didn't find any despair. There was no despair. I, I um, despite the dire situation, maybe because of it, the, our little interagency US government team at the embassy had very strong morale and unity of purpose. Um, I thank those teammates for that, but also want to give a big thanks to Kathleen Fitzgibbon for her leadership, she had been the charge de faire for over a year um, and then was the DCM after I arrived. Uh, Kathleen and the rest of the team, they're the ones who are the real heroes. But, but so, you know, we built on that foundation. We had a strong team. We had a resilient team, a dedicated team. Um, Deb said this earlier, communications, communications, communications. Facts, I think, are the best antidote to fear. So getting information out on a constant basis um, at country team meetings, town hall meetings, by walking around, talking to people, getting the facts out there and being transparent about that. That alone, I think, dispels a lot of fear and generates confidence. The other thing we would do as part of our communications is emphasizing what we were doing about the facts, the actions we were taking as a government, as a mission, and what other countries were doing, what the government was doing. Because in time, the response improved, became better organized, and re reporting those, those improvements and that good news to our team, I think, did a lot to generate calm and hope and confidence. Um, little things that, that add up, I think. Um, this was not a sprint. This was a marathon, but we were running as fast as a sprint. Uh, so <laughs> a burning crisis. So it was important that people took their leave and were able to rotate out for a while to sort of recharge their batteries. Um, just being seen, Kathleen and I think both shared this philosophy of just of, of getting together with people, um, visiting with the TDY CDC team, which was headquartered all the way downtown in a hotel, uh, you know, meeting with them, speaking with them, thanking them for what they were doing. And then we did what we could to sort of pull people away from work. Uh, we did two big Thanksgiving dinners at my house, uh, the, the two years of the, uh, of the outbreak. And I, and I think those little things add up and help. Um, but I'll stop there and just say uh, thank you again, uh, everyone, for organizing this. Um, I think we should all be very, very proud of what the whole team out in the field and in D.C. did uh, over the course of this outbreak. Um, I'm very proud to have played a small role in it. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Ambassador Powell. We're going to start the um, questions now, and I would just like our um, participants to keep their answers very brief so that we can get to them as many of them as possible. I think I'm not alone in this group of, as we've watched the COVID situation develop about asking what if questions. And one of the questions I wanted to ask Irv as um, someone who's still working and has just been through another crisis, what difference it might've made uh, if we'd had Zoom? 
Uh, how has this changed the response to an emergency like COVID or, or uh, Ebola or Afghanistan? Well, um, maybe my response will be uh, a little contrary, but I remember at the time related to Ebola, talking with my colleagues. So did we win World War II with a bunch of conference calls? No, we didn't. Um, the conference calls back then were legion and monstrous. And it got, got to a point where we ended up questioning their utility. Yes, we participated. But effective leadership isn't necessarily the same thing as constant meetings. Um, sometimes you need a lot of constant meetings to get to the right um, format of uh, effective leadership. But let me tell you, once we had the right leaders in place in all the key organizations, uh, not just our embassies, but their counterparts with the British and the French, and the e, um, EU, uh, UN, WHO, et cetera, et cetera, then it made it much easier. Um, look, we've managed crises with Zoom, with in the current situation. I, I remember the Afghanistan uh, question very, very uh, vividly from my, my recent work in SCA. We were working on the the extra um, the evacuation of our people and 125,000 Afghans in real time with WhatsApp groups and Facebook Live and et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's no going back. There's no turning the clock. It is what it is. It makes it incredibly difficult and it forces us to be even more deliberate and um, faster with our effective messaging. I'll stop there. Okay, thanks. There are a number of questions that uh, ask about careers in the, in the State Department. And I'm, I'm wondering if I could ask each of our three ambassadors to just briefly talk about what they see as the important uh, qualities that young Foreign Service, or not so young sometimes, uh, new Foreign Service officers bring to um, the State Department and what, what are important for success at the State Department. But just very, very briefly, uh, Ambassador Malik, can we start with you? Thank you. Um, I think flexibility continues some, to be something uh, an, uh, an asset that's absolutely critical. Uh, you know, flexibility, adaptability, energy or passion. You have to really care about the issues that you're dealing with. Otherwise, it won't make a difference. Um, and I think, in a bit, you know, increasingly um, a, a, a broader interest in, in constant learning, because those of us who were doing the Ebola response, for example, may not have had a real background in public health issues, but had to sort of immerse ourselves. And there are, you know, you could pick a, any sort of a subject that will arise. So I think some of that is the same that we've tried to encourage in the past, and I think it's still the case. But, you know, be willing to learn, be it flexible, be adaptable. Um, and bring an energy and passion uh, for, for problem solving. Okay, thanks. Ambassador Hoover? Yes, thanks. Um, not too much to add there to, to what Deb said. I'm, I'm super impressed by the young foreign service officers that I've worked with uh, sort of towards the end of my career. Um, two things, uh, I, would, I would agree with passion and energy. That's, I think that's really, really important. And I see it in our young officers, so I don't worry about it. And then the other thing is just being being team members, uh, teammates, and team builders. I think that's really important. We don't solve any of these complex problems without working together, having good interpersonal skills, and be willing to put the team first um, ahead of your own personal agenda. And again, I see that all the time in the young officers that I've worked with, and uh, they're very impressive. Ambassador Lewis yeah, thanks. You know, what is it we do as, as diplomats, as foreign service officers? Well, we persuade foreigners to do stuff. Now, I had not expected that I would spend two years of my life persuading Guineans to submit to, you know, 21 days of contact tracing or take loved ones uh, to Ebola treatment units. Okay, but the tools of persuading a foreigner to do something are, are the same. And, and how do you do that? Well, you have to know why it is they do what they do. So you have to understand uh, their history, their anthropology, their culture, their religious beliefs. And so the, the joy of our job is you immerse yourself in a foreign country, not as an abstraction, but as a, as, as a means of understanding, you know, how do I insert myself constructively into the national dialogue of a host country, whether it's, you know, Irv mentioned, we're very active in political reconciliation. Well, the, the very same skills, the very same uh, aspirations translate into, into any endeavor. And again, none of us ever expected 
uh, to be fighting Ebola for two years, but that anthropological approach to our job is both the joy of the job uh, and the necessity of the job. Thanks, Nancy. Okay, thank you. I'm going to uh, present a challenge from the chat room and give all of our participants a chance to think about it before I ask the one more question. The question is if you could describe, use one word to describe your service during the Ebola crisis, what would that one word be? So be thinking about it while I ask Dr. Penner and Dr. Martin, if they could talk just a little bit about what they see as needs for the people coming into the medical service at the State Department. Um, Dr. Martin, go ahead. Well, I, I think, you know, the double whammy of Ebola a few times and now the, you know, all, nearly two years of COVID have really kind of changed a lot of our medical officers. So this being attuned to the fact that novel things may occur and that novel things may occur in an area that's a bit more austere uh, and that we have to deal with these. I think you talked a little bit before about some of the lessons learned. And I think the lessons learned from Ebola really helped us do a lot better with COVID. Um, everyone was much more attuned to the fact of, you know, issues about transmissibility and what we needed to change. Uh, it, it really got people attuned to this. And I think our providers also learned a lot about this. They just watching what was going on in West Africa um, kind of vicariously still allowed them to see look, this could be me. And now it has been them. And everyone has been able to get through that. I'll stop at that point and see what uh, Dr. Penner has to say. Okay. Dr. P Dr. Penner? Uh, well, yeah, well, let me say right up front uh, that uh, working in the Foreign Service Medical Division is the best job you can have. Uh, I think that's a shared opinion by most of my colleagues. But I think, uh, you know, being willing to be in a medical austere environment and to deal with unexpected and unusual situations and medical issues that you never thought you would see in your career, uh, you have to have that flexibility and that, and that uh, uh, kind of uh, passion to do that because it's gonna happen. If you're in long enough, you're gonna run into these situations that, uh, uh, that are unique. Thank you. Um, I'm going to present this challenge now. I think this is particularly a challenge for those of us who are ambassadors to do one word. A Ambassador Lascaris, what is your one word? Fascinating. Ambassador Hoover? Uh, the question is, what's the one word that would describe what we did? As your service, um, your contributions? I would say if, it, if I have to pick one, it would be advocacy, both with Washington and locally. Ambassador Malik? Um, pride. Dr. Penner? I'd say teamwork. Uh, Kathleen Fitzgibbon? I'd say relentless. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sheila Passman? Sheila, are you there? Irv, Masinga? Determination. And let me add one more of appreciation for all of the efforts of the eight of you for the leadership that you have displayed. And let me turn it back to Ambassador Polishek. Thank you again for your contributions today and throughout your careers. Wow, thank you, Ambassador Powell, and thank you to our honorees for such a really powerful and enlightening discussion. Um, you all truly are heroes. And I think, uh, as I was listening to you, I, I hadn't realized the extent of the courage, the physical courage um, that went with everything that you all did back in that time. And on behalf of all of your colleagues in the State Department throughout the world, thank you for everything that you did. Um, I'd also like to just take a moment to, to uh, reflect on something that uh, one of the questions from the audience, it was about the, the qualities needed for uh, foreign service officers. And I'd just like to remind everyone, this effort, this amazing effort that we just heard about to, um, to help a, a part of the world and frankly, the whole world deal with this horrific and terrifying disease um, wasn't a foreign service effort. 
it was a State Department effort, a whole of mission effort. And the honorees that we have today, yes, some of them are Foreign Service officers. Two of them are, are medical specialists, medical officers, um, which is a, a category within the Foreign Service. But I guarantee there were dozens and dozens of civil service colleagues and especially locally employed staff who were just as vital to making all of this happen. And um, you know, here at the Foreign Service Institute, we say it's one team with one mission. And um, I know that all of these leaders that we honored today really um, embodied that spirit in pulling everyone together to respond to this really challenging situation. And, and thank you um, again to all of you for your service. And thank you also for framing what you did in terms of the lessons learned that we can all absorb um, today. And as we go ahead and, uh, you know, frankly, I think as, as uh, several of you said, that ability to respond to new crises, I think that's what we're, we're gonna have to deal with in, in the 21st century. So once again, thank you to all of you for a fascinating and inspiring discussion. For more information about the heroes that US Diplomacy Initiative, as well as to, to view a video from today's event, please visit state.gov uh, slash heroes of US Diplomacy and follow the hashtag heroes of US Diplomacy on social media. We would appreciate it if you could please take a moment to fill out our short, short audience survey, which is located in the chat box. And with that, this concludes today's virtual program. Thank you again for joining us. All the best.